Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mombasa Wala. You have been waiting for me, right? <laughs> Most of you do, OK? Mombasa Wala, Mohammed Said is my name. I am Chief Technology Officer for Keysight in India, and I am the moderator for the next panel, OK? And what is this panel about? What is this panel discussion about today? It's about the use cases in the network. So we are going to talk about not spectrum, something we can see, visualize, etc. Okay, and that will be followed by a small, small presentation of just 40 minutes from me. Okay, right. <laughs> so bear with me. I know the lunch is delayed. I am hungry too, but I want to make sure that you 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 go away either completely clear about 6G or completely perplexed about 6G. Okay, so. Let's start the panel discussion uh, with our guest today. I want to invite Dr. Vijay, Dr. Vijay Yagnanarayan, right? Dr. Vijay Yagnanarayan, please join me. He's a master researcher at Ericsson Research Center in India. Thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Vijay. I also want to invite Ms. Neha. Ms. Neha is principal architect at Samsung India, OK? Yeah, welcome. I want to invite Satish Kanugovi, if I'm pronouncing you right. Satish, where are you? Oh, yeah, you are here. And you are the head of Asia Pacific Standardization at Nokia. Okay. I also want to invite Dr. Arijit Majumda. He's a senior scientist at Samir. And lastly, I want to invite somebody. Guess the name. You have heard him several times. Girish Baliga, where are you? Yeah, you have three minutes to answer question, huh? not more. Okay. Okay. So, what are we going to discuss? We are going to discuss on use case and networks. Okay. And before we go into the actual uh, discussion, I want to just briefly touch upon few points. Uh, what is the timeline of 6G? When are we going to see it after I retire? Okay. That's in 2030. That's when we are going to see the deployment. And companies have started working on it. Network equipment manufacturers, operators. And the word which has not been used so far, which at least I have not heard, is hyperscalers. These are the companies which are giant software companies. And they have, they have started taking immense amount of interest in 6G. Because the use cases are very software centric. Immense amount of energy is needed in 6G in computing. That's something that we have to be aware of. Okay? And there are different architecture. Are we, are we comfortable with cloud architecture alone? You see, you do something in the cloud, okay, and then you have that small, you know, cursor keeps moving, right? Can it work for 6G? Absolutely no. You have a hybrid architecture, right? A split compute architecture, edge intelligence plus cloud. And how do they interwork? That's something that is going to play a pivot, pivotal role in deciding how 6G use cases are, okay? <clears throat> so hyperscalers have also started aggressively working on 6G, okay? They are doing their part. And what are the use cases? There are a lot of use cases. And the one that excites me the most is holography. I literally do not have to be here if 6G was there, right? And I would have been sitting in my home, of course, walking this way, and then my, my, my holographic image would have delivered. There are several more, you know. People talk about several use cases categorized in three categories. This is this three is very important, you know. In uh, in five G also, we said, uh, you know, uh, EMBB, URLLC, and MMTC, right? Here also, we talk about three things. That is connected intelligence, right? Lot of machines connected to each other to, to provide the intelligence. Connection of lot of sensors, right? That's the second use case. And the third is, of course, sustainability. What if I told you, and that's what something that we were discussing in the morning with uh, Dr. Vijay and uh, Arijit, uh, you know, 3% of the energy today is used by data centers and the, and the RAN network, or the networks, right? Okay? By 2030, this will be 20%. Can you imagine the amount of energy we'll consume? Okay? And this does not include all, that, all the energy that we are using in charging our phones, etc. right? So, we are energy guzzlers. And to make future technology sustainable is a task in itself that now we want to use it to be overlaid on use cases. Okay? And that's what we want to discuss in today's discussion. Okay? So I will take my seat. That's the assigned seat for me. Okay? And then I'll start discussing with my eminent panelist. Okay? So thank you. Thank you for joining. Okay? So I want to... Thank you. 
So I want to start with you, Dr. Vijay. Okay, uh, where are we? Where are we in terms of the investments that are there in uh, 6G currently? I think. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, my, my apologies. You know, this is going to be intense discussion. I'm requesting all the panelists to restrict their responses in three minutes, not more. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So if yeah. you if you look at the evolution of wireless com from from 2G to 6G, right? Or 6G is yet to come, but. 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, India has been very passive. So if, whether you look at uh, standardization or otherwise, very less action is actually from, from, from India. But 6G is going to be different. And why is it going to be different? In my view, it is primarily because of two reasons. One is a rapid digitalization that we have seen in, in recent years, right? And the second is, is, the, is a very proactive involvement of government, industry, uh, and academia in, in this sphere. So now if you look at the research landscape uh, for 6G in India, one can look at it from three perspectives. One can look at it from government initiatives, one can look at it from you know, um, uh, the, the government uh, uh, initiatives, one can look at it from industry, one can look at it from academia uh, research. So from the government initiatives, I think people have already talked about it. Uh, so recently, uh, uh, the government unveiled this Bharat 6G vision, which mm. consists of uh, a forum with where the industry and uh, the academic experts are, are part of this forum. And there are very nice task forces underneath that. And these task forces create these nice white papers and task reports which kind of tries to propagate government vision on what it wants to do with 6G. Now looking at uh, the, the, the industry or, or maybe the academic uh, research perspective, I think there it's very clear that all Indian top institutes are very active, including IASE and, and Indian Institute of Science. And recently we know that uh, this 6G testbed funding has come, which is a very good thing for us uh, and I think uh, this will enable these, re these, uh, these institutes to generate quality research output and, and hopefully they could push them into standards and, 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 and it can benefit our country a lot. And then looking at it from the, uh, from the, uh, the industry perspective, I think there are already several research labs in, in Bangalore and elsewhere who are conducting this 6G research, including Qualcomm, Samsung, Ericsson Research, Nokia Research and, and other companies. Just to give uh, some kind of a marketing for my own research group, so we have about 10 researchers who are working on cutting edge 6G problems like you know, joint communication and sensing, um, IRS and distributed MIMO and, and other things. Um, it's a, uh, it, there is a lot of things are happening uh, in this sphere, at least from the industry research as well. So all in all, I see that it's a very vibrant 6G ecosystem, unlike in the previous generation. So, I am confident that this time we won't be a pushover. So we will make a meaningful contribution. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, taking a clue, uh, clue from your response, uh, when you say there is too much of research that is going to happen, I just want to direct it to Dr. Arijit. So what is your view in terms of, you know, these big companies, uh, they do a lot of stuff. What is your view in terms of any benefit to startups in India? Any, any view from your point of view? Yeah, hello. Uh, uh, thank you. So um, essentially, uh, if you see uh, this uh, startup is a buzzword nowadays, if you see all around. And uh, in past several years, there is a very buzzing uh, startup ecosystem that is growing in our country. Uh, everybody knows about it. I, I think everybody sees Shark Tank. And then uh, <laughs> you have... Uh, Things like you, a lot of unicorns and government keeps telling that we have so many unicorn startups in our country and all that. But uh, what we need to understand amongst this ecosystem is that the startups, they face uh, several challenges when they try to participate in this kind of high technology areas. So the challenges, primary challenges that the startup uh, they face are essentially uh, they mostly seek funding from VCs. That is one point. And when you go to a VC, then generally the thought is that um, you require to have a very, very quick turnaround time for becoming profitable. Uh, 
and uh, that is justified also there is uh, no issue with that approach but when they want to participate in this kind of very very high technology areas which are very challenging even with big companies like nokia samsung qualcomm and they are putting in a lot of resources to come out with solutions then they require a lot of hand holding and support from the government side and the government is trying to do that in a big way so our ministry is basically now uh, trying to push uh, for every laboratory that is participating in this kind of research uh, 5g 6g that you take along startups and then you hand hold them and uh, what way they can benefit from this is uh, there are performance linked initiative schemes we are aware about it the pli schemes it's called by the government so they need hand holding in a uh, few areas like uh, one thing is that uh, you know the infrastructure that is required for this kind of research is very very costly okay we we talk about uh, millimeter wave like even fr2 uh, the infrastructure is not cheap and when we talk about going into terahertz like sub terahertz 140 gigahertz 300 gigahertz that test and measurement setup or experimental setup is extremely costly so that is one place where government is trying to uh, take the startups along that okay will probably fund and create a few center of excellences where these kind of facilities will be available for them so that they can also come and do their work. That is one approach government is taking. Okay. Second approach, uh, which is also very critical, and I do not know uh, uh, what government can do in this particular perspective, is on the point of manpower. Uh, you see that we, we lament, in fact, we are lamenting for past 10 years that we don't get good students or good manpower in the RF side, RF technology. Nobody wants to work in RF. Okay, the engineering students which come out, uh, and those people who want to come out, work in RF, coming out of IITs and IISs, they are finding greener pastures elsewhere. Okay, so it's that very means difficult. more money outside. Yeah, yeah, outside. exactly. Or joining very big companies. Okay. Oh, okay. But startups probably it's difficult for them uh, to afford that kind of a manpower with the kind of monetary backing they require. So that is also one part which needs to looked into, like how we can make people interested in this kind of work and then make this field as interesting, let us say as IT or VLSI or this kind of fields. Like these are buzzwords, these are fashionable words. Yeah. Students want to go into these fields, yeah, but yeah. nobody wants to work, let us say in a transmitter design at uh, 30 gigahertz yeah. okay so that is one one more point which i would like to mention and then uh, of course uh, the third point is that a uh, lot of technologies which gets developed into this kind of government laboratories or academic institutes they are lying there okay like i'll give you an example uh, dr rao told about uh, that y gig at 60 gigahertz which was developed way back we did a work on a 60 gigahertz link. We established a 64 quam 60 gigahertz link back in 2009 in our own lab. But that technology, there was no taker at that point of time. So it is lying idle, essentially. So there also better communication is needed, and government is trying to do that. They are trying to tell that you tell the world what technology you are having, what you have established in your laboratory, and don't put it inside some shelf and keep it there. Okay, so that uh, startups, we, we as a government lab, we are not good at marketing. Okay, let us let us be very frank about it. We are not good at marketing. We do so not we'll know. Market. We'll market. So your yeah, messaging, yeah. your yeah. messaging to startup is uh, you, you can exactly. be a location and where startups can come. And, and second and point is the right? topic of this particular forum is the innovation. Yeah. That is a topic. So we also are not very good at finding out innovative use of the technology. That is also one particular point we need to frankly accept. So startups are very good in doing this kind of thing. Okay, so okay, there yeah. the handholding can happen and a lot of work can happen together. I think Excellent. that's in a nutshell. Well said. Yeah, good. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Arijit. Uh, I want to turn to this, uh, the principal, uh, you know, the architect uh, of, of the network, okay, Neha. Uh, so how do you think the architecture of 6G will look like? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here for this interesting discussion. Uh, a brief intro about me, I'm Neha Sharma and uh, working with SRIB Bangalore. Like Kirti mentioned, there are two Samsung entities, one is SSIR and one is SRIB. 
So uh, like this topic is also around innovation and innovation is at the center of everything we do at SRIB. Uh, like we started the 5G research long back in 2011 and we the first one to develop the test bed and the chipset for that. And uh, the 6G research something we started way back in 2019 and I have a privilege to be part of that team where we started the work from the scratch. Uh, now, when you're talking about the 6G architecture, when you know the 5G architecture was designed, uh, there are a few requirements where they want to make it very scalable and very flexible network as compared to 4G. Like anything new thing you add, the new service you add, it should not be like, uh, you know, you have to do a lot of things. Uh, but if you see the reality, uh, you know, the 5G network architecture, uh, they're not actually deployed everywhere. Still, we are more into, uh, you know, a non-standalone mode where you still need a 4G network architecture. Uh, but there are like, it's because of the millimeter way because FR2 band itself was not deployed widely uh, in the, like especially in the outdoor side. Uh, now when we coming to the 6G thing, uh, 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 we not need a very complex system. If you see the 5G network architecture is extremely complex. We add too many things here and uh, how much is actually deployed. So uh, for the 6G network architecture, uh, one thing is they need to be fully cloud native. Uh, a lot of you know private uh, enterprises kind of applications are coming up. Uh, we need to have fi uh, network architecture which is aligned to that. And moreover, uh, we are going towards a virtualized and cloud native kind of principle. So uh, it should be well aligned to that and it have to be flexible. And uh, moreover, uh, the learnings we have from the current uh, existing 5G architecture uh, being uh, it's of the signaling issues or load issue or something, I feel those need to be addressed to the 6G. And uh, as we're going towards uh, talking about the terahertz band, which itself is a challenge in the 6G, uh, I guess the network deployments will change uh, drastically as compared to what we have in the 5G. Thank you. Okay, good. Taking a clue from your uh, answer, you know, you said something like enterprise, uh, there'll be a lot of use cases in enterprise. So I just want to flip it over to Satish. Satish, uh, you are uh, primarily into standardization and manufacturing, automation, etc. What kind of use case do you see in manufacturing in India uh, or manufacturing in industry per se? I mean, how 6G is going to benefit manufacturing? Thanks a lot, Mumba. Uh, namaste to all of you, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, so, so let me start with a little bit of background, not about myself, but uh, about manufacturing, and then different industries that have actually uh, benefited from the use of communication technology. So we have what we call as digital industries. So where uh, industries like, uh, like for example, banking, finance, commerce, uh, entertainment, wherein the main commodity was transfer of data from one point to another point to do the business. Those are the ones that have really taken benefit of communication technologies and you can see the success of UPI uh, or say for example, digital transmission of different education services. They are the ones that have actually benefited over the past years. Then there are the physical industries where there is a potential and there is a slow uptake of these technologies. For example, it could be in the domain of manufacturing, uh, logistics, logistics in terms of traffic management, providing that information so that you can do things uh, in a more uh, efficient way and that leads to uh, increase of efficiency in this. And then there are the physical industries uh, which are physical, as in like it is not just data that gets transferred, but then there are more laggards in terms of adoption. Those could be things like agriculture, mining, etc., where there is the thing. So therefore, uh, I mean, if you just look at the benefit that has been gained by the digital industries, you can actually extrapolate that the kind of efficiencies that you get, the kind of productivity improvements that you can get based on technology can be very well replicated to these physical industries, both the forwards as well as in the laggards. Uh, for example, if you talk about logistics, or the manufacturing. There is a lot of scope in terms of improving efficiency in the processes, uh, reducing the wastage. Actually, uh, communication networks we have studied can contribute to improvement of you know, uh, operational performance as well as reduction of capital wastage, as in like capital equipment wastage, whatever you put, to the tune of around 25 to 30%. These are the experiences that we have seen by the industries, for example, automotive industry, which is in the forefront of adoption of technology for such things. 
you know, this is the experience. So therefore, technology can indeed play a key role. But then you have to see that uh, the way these, uh, so we have to convert technology in a way that it can be, that it can be adopted by these industries. So just telling that I have a very high fidelity, high bandwidth channel that is very reliable is not going to help because the systems, uh, the way these industries are set up, the way uh, information has to be consumed are completely different. There are the existing IT systems, there are the physical infrastructure that may not be communication capable. So therefore, the network has to be more amenable in terms of abstracting the kind of APIs you give, the kind of facilities you give, that should be tailored to the verticals, if you may call them, for them to adopt it. So, so there has to be work from, from both the sides, from the side of communication technologies, to look not only in terms of adding capabilities that sound very glamorous, so to say, for example, keep increasing data rates or keep reducing latency, keep improving positioning accuracy. So those are certainly needed because they will be needed for certain use cases. But then how these services can get consumed by the verticals are an important part of uh, technology development as well as standardization. Hmm. Then secondly, in the same vein, there has to be some kind of awareness in uh, for these industries because if you always look at uh, the kind of upfront investment that you have to make, in terms of making your industry or the manufacturing unit or say the mind to be to be actually capable of taking in uh, the benefit of communication then it will never work because they will find always 10 ways and they have been doing it from like hundreds of years right i mean uh, communication came now but then these industries have been there for so many years so they will always find ways to to get that extra 10 percent five percent benefit by using other means but then uh, there has to be a leap of faith, if you may, okay, uh, like an awareness that if you put this upfront investment in making our systems in the industries communication ready, there is going to be a tremendous uh, improvement that you can foresee because then you will be able to get intelligence that is from the internet uh, or say the wider area. I mean, all those artificial intelligence platforms, perception that you can get, the kind of inferences that gets more and more accurate based on a large amount of data collected worldwide. I mean, all those things would then also be available to these industries for improvement. So in, in summary, yeah. I mean, there is a role for communications uh, infrastructure, uh, whether it, you call it 4G, 5G, or going ahead in 6G. Uh, for, mani for enabling yes. ma man manufacturing, right? And uh, Dr. Arijit, extending that question to you, uh, how is it going to impact Make in India program of the government? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a very, very uh, pertinent question. So uh, this uh, Make in India program, uh, generally uh, we see this kind of um, uh, manufacturing activity in a country, uh, it's kind of market driven. Like the requirement of the market is met with the kind of manufacturing capability the country has or the country wants to build some manufacturing capability. But on top of that, government can also play a very big enabling role on these kind of initiatives. And the government is trying to do so for the past few years. So uh, as an example, uh, I do not know how many of you are aware, but there is a mandate from the government to all government institutes that whatever uh, in, uh, hardware we are uh, procuring for whatever use, maybe for R&D, uh, maybe for operation, maybe for other kind of deployments, there needs to be a Make in India component in that. Okay, so there are two categories given. One is like 20% has to be make in India and another category is 50% has to be make in India. So what this policy is doing is basically, this, kind, this is kind of forcing the industry or the market to develop manufacturing base in the country. Okay, this is, enab this is government enabling uh, the manufacturing base or the manufacturers so that they, they, they now know that if, the, if they want to have a business in the country, some kind of a manufacturing base is needed. Without that, because all of you know that government is the biggest buyer in the market. Okay, government is kind of a biggest buyer in the market. So, or at least one of the biggest. So uh, this is kind of forcing that. On top of that, if you see, uh, there is a lot of technology which is being indigenously developed in the country. And 
as uh, Dr. Rao always points out, that earlier we had technologies, but we never had solutions. We, we have not developed end-to-end -end solutions in the country. That's why whatever technology is developed, as uh, he has rightly pointed out, industry is always not ready to take up that technology. It's not convenient to them, or it may not be profitable to them even to work with that technology. They require end-to-end -end solutions. But now that is being emphasized a lot in the country. Like for the 5G testbed, it's an end-to-end -end solution which has been designed, developed, kind of deployed locally inside IIT Madras in the country. So now different industries, various industries has come up to us that, okay, we now see that this is an end-to-end -end solution. Give us the technology. We are ready to take it up and manufacture it within India. So these kind of initiatives are needed not only in the communication space, maybe in the other spaces as well. So that, I mean, this kind of make in India work, that progress is very, very fast. And so do, so this manufacturing base is needed. Do you mean to say that 6G or 5G manufacturing will accelerate government initiative yeah, yeah, of yeah. make in it India? Will definitely is that what accelerate. 5G, yeah. it is definitely going to accelerate uh, the 5G equipments deployment. I'm not talking about handsets. I'm mostly talking about the back end, the, maybe the base station equipment and all those kind of stuff. So give us more good news like that, <laughs> huh? more acceleration, <laughs> more of this. Yeah. So Neha, I want to turn it over to you. Uh, you know, we spoke enough of manufacturing. Now in terms of uh, the complexities that get involved in terms of the speed or the compliances that you have in manufacturing, okay, uh, how do you see the role of software, the cloud and the, the edge uh, intelligence that you have to provide in this, uh, you know, People talk a lot on a cloud, and, and I'm still not able to figure out what actually is the content. OK, so uh, see, like you talk about the cloud. Uh, this is like, you know, again, a buzzword in the 60s. And uh, we are talking a lot about the connected intelligence in the 60s. And the two key elements for that would be like split computing and the edge uh, intelligence. So basically, you know, in the 60s, uh, one of the perception is like, you know, the way we, uh, the digital uh, uh, use cases are there or, you know, they maybe it's like digital twin or holography, which has even talked during the 5G time also. Uh, but it was not actually, I guess, translated into the actual applications. But now uh, with the terahertz band and, uh, you know, the kind of uh, application that Terahertz band can provide uh, with the high data rates and this thing. So uh, uh, for this, uh, you know, in terms of this one, uh, when we talk about the split computing or the cloud or the edge intelligence kind of thing, uh, there is uh, done at the side of, you know, uh, at the edge. So when we talk about the applications of, say, the, uh, like you said, about the latencies, uh, high data rates and all, that can be achieved through this. And even from the uh, cloud perspective, uh, we can have certain functionality which can be done at the cloud uh, or something can be done near to the uh, edge devices, which will overall uh, bandwidth optimizations can be there. You do a lot of things at there. And with the cloud, the major benefit could be like, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, 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 I mean, scalability can be there. Like, you don't need to allocate a proper resources to one specific device and all. You can, uh, you know, assign it as per its requirement, which comes from the split computing. So uh, the thing is, uh, with all these things and uh, having uh, all a lot of functionality at the edge and uh, whatever is required at the cloud, uh, a lot of good system can be built. And uh, this definitely, you know, also help to increase the storage requirements or scalability or the power requirements of the system, which is one of the goal for the 6G. And it necessarily has to be on terahertz, this kind of manufacturing uh, applications and the, uh, the edge intelligence and all that stuff, no? Not really, because, you know, even in the 5G also, we talk about the edge computing. Uh, but what happened in the 5G is we first were very much focused on the millimeter wave, uh, everything, all the technologies were around that, and then slowly other things were introduced. But I guess when we're going to now design the 6C system, the terahertz is going to be more challenging. It's like has a limited coverage and all. And we have a lot of learnings from the 5G, uh, like what all, you know, shortcomings of the 5G and what all new technology which was introduced as part of uh, 3GPP and all those things. So all those things, you know, can be now integrated when we are going to design the 6C system. As an example, we're talking about AI and all. 
uh, which is now getting, you know, you are uh, adding into the 5G system, but that may not work in the way people are imagining. So 60, when we design the 60 system, you know, it can be integrated into the AI. I mean, AI can be integrated from the scratch itself. So that means you can design a much better system as compared to 5G. Okay, good. So Girish, I want to ask you a very pertinent question related to this. You know, so far there has been a lot of pressure on engineers uh, to measure up the things for hardware. Uh, the measurement for software has not been very clear so far, okay? Um, uh, when I speak to some of the, uh, the hyperscalers, they say that they want to figure out the time spent in data access versus computing, okay? That's one of the measurements that they are looking at. What is Keysai doing in measuring those performance indicators for 6G or these cloud native or edge intelligence, whatever people speak about, uh, you know, in, in measuring. Thanks, Mumba. Uh, actually, we are on the same side of the fence, so uh, I was raring to go. <laughs> Am I audible? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> uh, as a representative at Keysai Technology, right, what we do is just measurement science, right, and you kind of uh, implement those measurement science into instrumentation so that everyone has the first mover advantage. It's pretty straightforward. So uh, having said that, uh, one of the key aspects when uh, uh, we are architecting stuff, right? So uh, uh, designers would look at end-to-end uh, -end kind of uh, coverage. And uh, like Mumba rightly said, uh, uh, one key aspect which you need to ensure that is that uh, the entire chain uh, when you have the uh, uh, the design life cycle, which may encompass predominantly a lot of software, and then uh, uh, there, there's going to be a hardware part piece in the entire cycle, as well as the system level uh, design and development and validation and so on. So uh, one of uh, uh, the prime uh, considerations that need to be uh, envisaged is to ensure that whether it is uh, simulation and modeling, or when it comes to say a lot of pre-silicon work which is happening or then you move, in, move into the lab with your chipset or system or module or subsystems and so on. And then specifically talking about uh, conformance, so compliance and uh, design validation and uh, specifically starting from uh, bring up, right? So you need to ensure that uh, everything uh, which is done uh, is seamlessly uh, moving. Like uh, one of the speaker mentioned in the previous uh, uh, <laughs> panel, right, is that the first two, first more advantage is of prime importance, right? Nowadays, it so happens that competitors catch up like anything. And if you miss the bus, it's gone. So as a test and measurement vendor, right, what we typically do is we do have folks who sit on the test committees of standards bodies. And uh, if you're specifically talking about, uh, say, hyperscalers or data centers and so on, right, we have folks who are the members on the test committee of the standard, but let's say IEEE if it is Ethernet, or if you're talking about optical, which is a big piece there, right, or you have the OIF. We have folks whose full-time activity is to architect the next generation standard, or if you're talking about even computing standards, which become the uh, backbone for these uh, back planes, right? Then we have folks sitting on, say, uh, PCI Express through the PCI SIG or uh, even JDEC for memory based solutions. So, and specifically talking about uh, today's flavor, which is 6G, uh, we do have folks uh, who are part of uh, uh, 3GPP and ITUT and so on, right? So, what they do is they ensure that the overall uh, architecture is stitched into the standards even before your device or uh, probably the chipset comes into the lab so that it's not that we uh, leverage them as uh, guinea pigs or beta customers, right? Everything is written in stone even before you have silicon in the lab. So test and measurement companies like Keysight ensure that everything is taken care and uh, I will <laughs> I not want to preach to the choir, everybody knows what you are doing. So if you are talking about uh, PCT, PRT and blah, 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 all this kind of uh, measurements, uh, that's pretty much uh, evident that uh, with 5G, uh, we kind of uh, rode that uh, wave and ensured that uh, you come first to the market and so on. But and with 6G, it's not going to be any different. But there are its own set of challenges like uh, uh, the guy spoke here, right, that okay, with the millimeter wave or sub terahertz, that's going to have a new set of challenges, but that's why we are there. I mean, once we have challenges, we have opportunities. When you have opportunities, there's business to be done, right? So it's all for profit. So uh, we work very, very closely with the academia and also with the industry to ensure that it's a win-win for everyone. That's pretty much I want to sum up quickly. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, I, uh, I would come back to you later.
Okay, uh, but before that, I want to ask you, um, uh, Dr. Vijay, is AI ML the basic essential part of 6G? Uh, why I'm saying this is because people talk about virtual network and virtual antennas now. So can you throw a light so on AI yeah, ML? Maybe, yeah, that's, a good, that's an interesting thing that is happening. So may, maybe I want to give you a, a, a view of 6G, which is a little bit different from, um, from many of them. I think can what you, is going to happen, yeah, yeah, what is going to happen with 6G is that we will see a paradigm shift from the from the network which is kind of manually controlled into a network, a learnable network, which can use these AI ML models to learn, uh, learn uh, its actions, et cetera. Now, if you look at what kind of roles that these AI ML methods can play, you can look at it from two angles. One, from various RAN and protocol layer functions, and another could be from various network operations that you need to do to have the network going. So from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the RAN functions, what I think we will have is a, is a network wherein you will see scheduling, coding, modulation, I don't know, channel estimation, beam forming, hardware impairment, mitigation, everything will have some kind of an AI ML built into it. The reason for this is primarily because of the operating point of 6G is such, is as such, that it is extremely complex and difficult to model them mathematically. So when you have a system which is difficult to model mathematically, then the solutions that you offer will be inefficient. So naturally, the data-driven approach is favored for this. So that's why I see a role of AI ML going to take a predominant role. Now, from the network operation perspective, right? So the most of the network adaptation will happen through AI ML modules. And typically these modules will take the real time analytic data and it will try to provide you with a, some kind of a zero touch operation and control. And I also think the network management aspect could also become much more cognitive in the sense that the, the operator or, or the uh, operator will primarily specify what he wants in some kind of, uh, he will declare his intent in, in some kind of a high level abstraction. Then you have these collaborative AI ML uh, 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 agents which will translate these high level intents into actionable uh, actions uh, using some kind of a knowledge base which it has built using uh, its past historical uh, actions. So this is one side of the thing. Now, as uh, Neha was explaining, the another uh, angle to this is that 6G will bring all physical things and its control into a paradigm of connectivity and compute. So what will happen is that you will see the, the use cases and applications try to leverage this network compute uh, 6G platform to offload its data towards the edge and get the inferencing and, and all these complex AI methods run there get the inference and, and just render those inference or take actions based on those inferences. So all these uh, uh, will happen and, and I, in this way I think AI ML will take a central stage. Uh, all it, you will see the impact of it uh, in the use case perspective across verticals because this is the standard paradigm in which uh, they will run. So automotive, transportation, uh, industry, e-health, everything will get impacted because the but way their process will be different. Okay. And they use 6G platform not just to provide connectivity and exchange data between them, but they want to use it more like a network slash compute fabric. So that is where the difference is. Once you have compute built into it, then uh, AI, ML, and other things become more, much more reasonable to implement and do. Got it. So RLC Mac layer will still stay. <laughs> That is an interesting question. So now what is going to happen is we are so used to this very nice partition protocol layer like L1, L2, physical Mac, uh, RLC, and things like that. I think one of the things that could happen is, is an end-to-end -end AI ML component which, which could go across layers. And you, you will see these end-to-end -end ML uh, solutions which will erase the borders between the layers as well. So that, that is going to happen as well. So the whole network protocol design will also change. 
So it need not uh, have to stick to the old uh, OSI or modified OSI uh, layer model. Yeah. Okay, good. So Neha, you are giving the architecture. He is giving AI ML. Okay. So what use cases are you giving, Mr. Satish, for connected intelligence uh, in in 6G? Any thought on that? On connected intelligence and also on some sustainability. People talk about a lot of sensors, zero uh, power sensors, and all that. So what use cases do you suggest? Yeah. yeah. You can use this mic instead. All right. This is how standards work. Uh, cooperation between uh, partners who might be competitors when they go to market. This is an excellent example. I Thanks thought, a lot, Vijay. I thought only Greece is going to sell his company. You have also started selling your company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I uh, get salary for uh, doing standards. So <laughs> I need to stress the importance of ecosystem. So as I was trying to say, uh, I want to take the liberty of having the mic and answer uh, something that, uh, or maybe add a perspective. So Make in India is certainly important, and I just also wanted to tell you, you must be very happy to know that Nokia has been manufacturing uh, base stations at our Chennai facility for a long time. And we actually not only manufacture for India, but we manufacture here and, and actually export the world. And we would be very happy to have more people. and. Uh, uh, you know, joining the bandwagon. Uh, that is certainly there, and we are more than happy to also share our, share our experiences. Uh, you might uh, know that, you know, like every call that goes through, goes through a Nokia network element in India as of today. Okay. And uh, we are supporting 50% of the network, and remaining 50 comes in terms of 5G from my uh, friend uh, Vijay's company. Uh, so in that sense, uh, one point I wanted to stress as part of the Make in India thing is that there are partners who have a capability and intent to participate with the local ecosystem, uh, there have to be avenues uh, that have to be created where such things uh, are possible. So there is strength with indigenous Indian companies. There is strength with companies which have become indigenized over a period of uh, nothing less than 25 years now. So, so there has to be a good balance. I mean, whatever works for India has to be figured out. Uh, rather than following a model that is with our neighbor, uh, that might be a completely different uh, thing that has happened. So sorry for uh, uh, bringing that in, because standards is about bringing different partners to solve common problems. Yes. Right? And then coming back to the different use cases that we can uh, envisage that this connected intelligence uh, could, uh, could enable. Right. So, so one thing which also ties into your initial uh, question about industrial automation, as in like, why do we need to do this industrial automation? And you know, what would be the thing that we would expect 6G to do differently as compared to the earlier things? So, so as I was talking about digital and so I was talking about this digital industries, which have an innate ability to consume communication uh, and then do, a, do an improvement. And then there are these physical industries. So the digital industries are just only contributing to 30% of the GDP. Okay, Remaining 70% comes from the physical industries. So, so if there is any country, and India is certainly, which wants to say, for example, uh, improve its GDP, uh, improve the economy to whatever, 5 trillion that we uh, think, right? So there has to be focus on technology solutions of how we improve efficiency of these physical industries. And that's where technologies like 5G, which has started uh, to introduce uh, to introduce features, which are not only focusing on end-to-end -end user communication, for example, talking, videoing, uh, and streaming, etc., but then also catering to the needs of the industry. So typically, what happens if you have seen from the previous generations? So there is one generation that actually introduces the technology, and then at a scale, it gets deployed only in the future generation. For example, 2G introduced digital voice, but at scale, I mean, at a cost that was available for common man to use that only came via 3G. Mm. 3G introduced data, but then at a scale, it was only available in 4G. And it is such an excellent technology. I mean, today, because of 4G, everybody can dare to say, for example, take a call even in a hotel like this and uh, still get along. Right? 5G started with introduction of features that have this industrial thing in mind. For example, trying to provide positioning in addition to just communication. Trying to provide features like, for example, higher reliability, which are needed not for people talking, but for machines to communicate. So those things have started to come. 
the basic infrastructure is there, but then to scale, based on our experience of how these features get deployed in 5G, we'll all get incorporated into what we will see in 2030 as 6G. So therefore, uh, connected intelligence that will enable improving productivity of the industries is certainly something that we can expect from 6G. So in addition to that, as Dr. Ganti was talking, we have this sensing, which is, which is another angle that actually uh, gets added with 6G, uh, right? I mean, that is sure. being talked about. Yeah. So that provides you an ability to map without the need for the actual devices to have the sensors, and that has a profound impact. I mean, if you have to put a sensor on everything that you want to track and understand, it is certainly not a scalable solution. But if we are able to develop a technology that can reasonably uh, be able to, that can reasonably identify, detect, locate objects, then certainly things like digital twin, as some of my esteemed panelists were talking previously also, those things become really practicable. Currently, the very fact about you know trying to understand what my environment is, uh, is not such a scalable thing, both in terms of cost as well as deployment, because you know it takes so much of equipment, so much of power that needs to be provided to the equipment for us to create that thing. Okay. So, so certainly industrial automation is yeah. one thing. And then you talk about sustainability. So, so what do you think uh, could be the most important feature that our operators ask for when we say that we are coming up? So we have given you 5G, so feel blessed now since we have uh, done that job and we still need to earn our salaries for the next 10 years, we'll do 6G. So what do you want from us? What do you think could be the one thing that they say? Maybe we have to ask somebody from Reliance Geo then. Reliance Geo, yeah. because Okay, I'll not put you in a spot because you're my friend and you're also my customer, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, so they actually, uh, okay. So, so, so what we actually, uh, you know, hear from them is that we want, irrespective of whatever, uh, you know, uh, feature that you give us, if it consumes any more energy than it consumes today in our network, we will not take it. Mm. Such is the kind of pressure that the operators have from their, from their deployment folks, from the people who are actually running the networks. So therefore, sustainability, uh, irrespective of whatever feature you put, whether it is, uh, whether it is sensing or you talk about higher data rates, uh, you know, positioning, etc. If it is going to consume more energy from the network, that is going to be not deployed at all. Okay. So therefore, sustainability, is a key design factor across any feature that is going to get developed in the network. Okay. So there again, there are certain learnings. So we can always learn from what we have done before. Not that they are mistakes, but just experiences to start improving something in 6G. So we were talking about different waveforms that would be uh, that would be enabling us to communicate in terahertz is what we are looking. Yeah. But then our focus, based on the experience of what we hear on the ground, is certainly different. Uh, so you would be very surprised to know that, although we talk about very high data rates in 5G, 80% of the time, base stations run at 20% of the load. So not many people are using 1 Gbps data. So 20% of the capacity is what the base station runs at for 80% of the time. But then, if you compare at that low data rates, if you compare 4G, okay, so let's compare 4G versus 5G. So because we have to sell 5G, we yeah. say that 5G is 10x more efficient than 4G. But at what rates? At very high rates. At very low rates, actually, 4G would be more efficient. Or even I would say, if you go to 2G or 3G, that would be more efficient for the data rates that is needed. So, so what we are trying to say is energy conservation is a prime criteria for operators. Energy right? yeah. conservation is a prime criteria for the operators, yeah. for the world, and hence for the technologists also. When we are designing waveforms, we not only talk about improving throughput, but also we look at making it flexible so that at the point where it is needed to provide the throughput, we use an appropriate waveform. Yeah. It could be I an mean, evolution of OFDM or whatever uh, Dr. Rao talked. But then at those low rates where you have the network operating, we also have a mechanism to, to then flexibly change to a different waveform. Yeah, so Satish, uh, you know, uh, I'll flip over this question to Girish. Do you have any any measurements for uh, energy audit of network or any solutions, measurement solutions? Just <coughs> quick 30 minute, uh, 30 second answer. Yeah, Sorry. we are running out of time. I'll keep it uh, <coughs> short. <laughs> 
So uh, as key site and as a session measurement vendor, right, and uh, premium, premium one at that. So uh, specifically now everybody knows about ORAN, right? ORAN is kind of uh, there everywhere. I mean, and uh, if you're specifically looking at those kind of uh, technology applications, there have been a lot of tools uh, which uh, we as a vendor provide, which not only provides, uh, say, uh, application with respect to security, which is of paramount importance. And I, I also had some uh, chat with a uh, uh, couple of uh, folks uh, from uh, uh, more on the network side where they say, okay, you guys are talking about spectrum and that and this and all that, but what about security? Uh, definitely that was one aspect which uh, we talk about, but of course that's a topic for another day because in half a day we cannot yeah. do everything because it's so wide. But now specifically coming to your question, Energy, secur uh, energy security and uh, power consumption is going to play a very, very important role. And I specifically uh, took a dig at ORAN because with ORAN, we are uh, ensuring that it's not just ORAN which is getting proliferated everywhere, but also to ensure that it is pretty energy efficient. We do have a, a host of uh, tools as part of the test and uh, measurement ecosystem which will take care of that aspect. Having said so, we also will ensure as the technology evolves, and specifically when you're talking about sub terahertz kind of uh, systems taking shape as we speak, right? Energy efficiency is going to be of paramount importance, like uh, Mr. Satish mentioned. So we uh, we are working in the background to ensure that uh, at the end of the day, these don't end up as power guzzlers, and then uh, I mean. Mother Earth uh, doesn't care. I mean, uh, the human species has to kind of uh, be there. We will be instinct. Uh, Mother Earth will still be there, right? So we have to ensure that we are also responsible uh, for the environment. By the way, uh, Environment Day was just yesterday, so it's not a <laughs> talk on about uh, on what we have to be very, very uh, kind of cognizant about whatever uh, data centers, hyperscalers, and uh, these kind of things which are running, right? They need to be energy efficient. And specifically to Mumbai's question, we do have a lot of uh, tools uh, on ensuring that, okay, these set of flip-flops or these kind of blocks within the chip or within the device or so on need to be in either sleep mode or probably you put them in standby and so on. And you consume only that much amount of power that is required by the network or okay. the system or the uh, good. device so, and so on. Good. Uh, so, uh, Girish, you said something about security. Security. That's one area which we did not touch upon. The security has been rephrased now in the industry as trustworthy networks, right? And uh, Dr. Vijay, in paucity of time, I would need just 30 second answer from you in terms of, you know, how trustworthy are you going to make 6G for me? Yeah, I, th I think the, the, the word trustworthy for me, it, it involves two things. One is the reliability, okay. the reliability aspect of it. And another one uh, is, is its ability uh, to, to security itself. I mean, uh, so you, one can look at reliability of the network as a as a as its ability to you know withstand and uh, recover when things go wrong. The security widely means that how do you ensure integrity of data? So now with this new paradigm, the security aspect, the the, the data in transit is kind of very well studied problem. I mean, it's been there. You have these transport layer protocols which provide you with that. But where the challenge is, once the payload is downloaded and started processing, this is where the things become vulnerable. So the cloud service provider can tamper with that data. Then the question is, how do you ensure that, uh, that the data integrity is still maintained so that whoever needs to access, only those people can actually touch that data. So that is one challenge. The another thing is that you see this EIML being used everywhere, right? But think about it. In a classical model, I have a nice understanding of my system, right? I mathematically derive, I know that my poles are zeros and I know when the control system fails, whatever. But when you design systems using data, you don't know what it has learned. So it is very difficult to understand what is the, the underneath phenomena that is governing the actions of the agents. So there is this new field of uh, trustworthy AI, which is evolving now, so so th which is tries to answer, can you explain the actions? Can you ensure that you take actions which are safe, and things like that? Okay. So that Go is ahead. another interesting area. So what I see is that in future uh, generations, especially with 6G and beyond, 
the trustworthy AI, formal verification of hardware we know, but formal verification of AI is something which can come. And then computational, uh, confidential computing, which, uh, which talks about my earlier issues with the hardware, you know, the data which can be tampered after you download. So those, those uh, research areas will evolve and take a center stage in network design and operation. Okay, good. And that's what so You know, doing. when I retire, I'm going to hire uh, Dr. Arijit for make it, for make it manufacturing through Make in India. You will give me a trustworthy network while you will architect my network and make my measurements right. Okay, uh, ah, yeah, you will manage my finances, right? Get me a few, few millions of dollars from outside. Thank you so much. It has been my joy and pleasure to be amongst the eminent panelists. You know, we are the holders, not me, all others inclusive, okay? They are the holders of 250 patents together, all put together, with a collective experience of 120 years, okay? So thank you very much for your presence and time. Thank you. It has been excellent, okay? Okay, so this is something that I have to give. Uh, this is for Mr. Satish. Yeah. Yeah. And this is for Arijit, Dr. Arijit. Thank you. And this one for Ms. Neha. Dr. Vijay. Why? Oh, okay. Thank you. I am getting it too. <laughs> Seldom that I get something from Gautam. And a group photo. Yeah, okay. A yeah, group please. photo? Yeah. yeah.